Hello everyone and welcome to my kitchen um, slash home gym. Um, I am uh, recording this from sunny Sydney. It's actually beautiful weather today. Um, but yeah, we're still in lockdown so training is still happening at home and I thought I would take this as just a reason to go through some of the messages that I get from people and followers and clients and friends with Ellis danlos Syndrome because I get quite a few messages from people with EDS um, and I love receiving them and if I don't get back to you I'm really sorry I just I get sometimes a little bit overwhelmed <laughs> um, but I want to get through them now so I have one message in particular that I wanted to um, give an answer to and I've got I made some notes so I'm gonna read out the question I'm just gonna get stuck straight into it I'm gonna read out the question and then I'll go through my uh, carefully formulated response so the question is hi I saw your post on your story but my question was too long for me to ask over that I was wondering would you be willing to talk about what an individual with hypermobility or Ehlers-Danlos sy syndrome should realistically uh, should realistically expect from getting into powerlifting and is there anything that you recommend to those athletes who are first starting out are there certain obstacles in your experience to expect that differ from someone without EDS I'm super passionate about being a strength athlete and I just started to get into powerlifting, very exciting, but I deal with hypermobility. If this is too much or doesn't make sense, no worries, thank you. No, it's not too much and it does make sense. Um, so for those who don't know, I'm doing, like I compete in bodybuilding now, but my past was powerlifting. So I also have a genetic condition, Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, which causes joint hypermobility and is a real pain in the ass, <laughs> but that's okay. So this, question made me really excited. It was, um, I love hearing about people with Ehlers-Danlos and joint hypermobility getting into strength training. Strength training is the best thing for um, my joint hypermobility and my Ehlers-Danlos. Um, it is one of the best things that you can do. And if you're someone who is competitively minded or ambitious or goal oriented, like some people are, some people aren't like that, but the, those who are, the natural progression for that is to do strength sports. So I'm really excited um, for this person. And I definitely do have some tips and some just general thoughts on the matter. So let me get into <laughs> what I've written down. So what to expect. There's two parts of this and I'm gonna go through what to expect. If you've got joint hypermobility or Ellis Danlos and you're getting into strength sports. And the second thing is some tips around it. What to expect, the number one thing that I think you should expect, if this is you, is big things. Expect big things of yourself. Um, it's really easy when you've got a condition, especially when you are dealing with a lot of doctors, medical personnel, you yourself lose faith in your body because your body can just be a real asshole and just not work sometimes. Um, expect big things from yourself and you can take this far. I took it far. I took it to international level competitions. Um, it won't be easy, but you can expect big things. There are so many different ways to gain an advantage. So you're disadvantaged because you've got um, some performance deficits that come about because of the joint hypermobility. Um, you're at a disadvantage because you have to work a lot harder than everyone else um, just to have a normal body. And then from then on, you have to push even harder to become competitive. But there are so many different ways that you can gain an advantage. So I like a, just a little example for me, I remember when I was prepping for my pro or competitions, for example, um, I didn't let myself look at the social media of um, the other competitors because I knew I wasn't training at maximal effort. I couldn't train maximally. I was training sub-maximally all the way through all my preps. Um, and I knew if I looked at my competitors, I knew that I could see them pushing hard, going to failure, grinding it out, things that I couldn't do safely. And... If I had looked at them, I would have just become completely disheartened. So the things that I really worked on were really fine tuning technique. I took the time to figure out exactly which programs would work the best for me. My coach at the time was very good at experimenting with different things and figuring out what worked. Um, getting a really good team of people around you. I've got the best physio in the game. I've got a great rehab specialist for my hip now. You know, I've got a freaking amazing coach you know I've got I work at base gym I've got the best strength athletes and coaches in my corner and there are so many people out there competing who don't have all those things so build yourself a team of people 
be prepared to work really hard and look for those 1% things, those 1% things that will give you an advantage because you can expect big things from yourself. So the second thing I would say that you're going to gain is incredible body awareness. Um, I am so much more aware of each individual muscle in my body and each different joint and each different movement and all these things that a lot of my friends who don't compete or don't train don't have. And with Ella's Danlos, that's so important and it gives you this awareness that is positive, not just negative. You're not just thinking, oh, that's pain, that's pain, that's pain. You're like, no, that's maybe it's muscle soreness and it's a good kind of pain or maybe you're feeling stable rather than unstable joints. So there's a lot of really good things that you can gain in terms of body awareness. Um, the third thing to expect is lots of frustration and it doesn't get easier. The, the feeling of working so hard for your goals only to have them taken away from you because one day your body plays up and you can't walk. I know, like I know how that feels. I know how it feels. Something to expect is you will get out of this helplessness feeling that you get when you, when you have LSD and loss or you don't have mobility and you're unable to do anything. That's a helpless feeling, but it's a very different feeling of frustration with your body when you, when you put in the work, you do the work and then it slips away from you. And I'm not going to lie, you will have that feeling. Um, I forget when I feel good, I forget how bad it feels to feel bad and then it happens. <laughs> And it's like this dark cloud around me that I just, I think, you know, you get so worried, you get, you know, what, what else is going to happen? How bad is this going to get? How bad is this going to get? You just have to appreciate everything that your body can do when it can do it, because sometimes you won't be able to do those things. So I will warn you, there will be a lot of frustration. Um, I remember for my last bodybuilding prep, some days I couldn't walk. The pain in my hip was so bad. I couldn't walk and I had to do my cardio. I had to still train and the frustration of knowing that I couldn't push as hard as I wanted to was I, it, it, I was in tears, like from the frustration, not from the pain, like the pain, whatever, like pain's just like part of the game, right? But the frustration of not being able to do everything was uh, overwhelming. Um, uh, fourth, uh, one, two, three, yeah, four, we're up to four. The fourth thing to expect is you're gonna have to explain yourself. Um, so this is coming into one of the tips that I wanna give you, and that is to find a coach who understands, believes, uh, preferably knows about the condition, um, that's actually why I moved down to Sydney. When I moved down to Sydney, um, it was because I met Sebastian at Face Gym who actually knew about the condition and had um, family members who experienced this condition. And I knew that I wouldn't have to explain myself at every step with him. And that feeling is not something you get very often. Um, also, he's a freaking great coach. So that was also why. But a big part of it was the fact that he knew about it. So the fourth thing is you will have to explain yourself a lot and especially at the start and I even find it now that I have to kind of I uh, maybe it's just a complex that I have maybe it's actually the reality but I feel like I have to explain myself to people to get them on board with the fact that I work hard like I need to prove that I work hard because when I say that I can't do something people need to understand that I can't do it because I can't do it not because I'm lazy so getting that communicated across early on with your coach is really important you might have to explain yourself to your training buddies or to your friends, but to be honest, if they're good friends and good training buddies, you probably won't. And I just have gotten over explaining myself to people who aren't willing to understand. So for people like that, I just don't bother. But for coaches and things like it is worth the investment of actually explaining the condition. If you find after six months of working together, you're still having to constantly explain yourself, maybe they're not the right person for you. But you should expect to have to explain yourself a lot, which is stupid and frustrating and annoying. But I'm just being honest with what you have to expect. Uh, yeah, the next thing is you have to gonna have to work harder than everyone else. Like, I'm sorry, but it's true. And I don't mean push harder. I don't mean push more to failure. I don't mean do more sets, do more volume, all that kind of stuff. But the hard work of being an elite athlete is not always in the pushing. A lot of people get into sport because they enjoy pushing and especially strength sports. They enjoy doing those training sets where you lose hearing and sight afterwards. <laughs> Maybe that's just me, but I really like those. Um, the thing that you are going to have to work harder on is the little things. You will have to turn up half an hour early to your training session to do all your prehab rehab. You can't miss a day of doing your prehab rehab. If you do, you will suffer later. Your training, you won't be able to push in your training. Your prehab rehab work is going to bring you up to a baseline where you're almost normal. From there, you can train. Um, you're going to have to work harder with your diet. You're going to have to work harder with the 1% things. Supplements, you're going to have to get that on, you know, 
supplement and diet protocol is going to have to be good. Your sleep is going to have to be good. You're going to have to work hard to make sure your sleep is good. Me, Ronnie, come here, come here. Apologize, apologize. <laughs> no, don't, don't knock it over. Okay, bye. So yeah, you will have to work harder than everyone else um, and it will be in the little things and the things that aren't sexy and aren't fun and don't give you a rush. And that's just what being an elite athlete is all about. Um, and if you ask any of the top athletes, that's probably the stuff that they do better than the people who aren't the top athletes. You know, the best in the world and the people who aren't the best in the world probably still have the same goals. You know, first place and second place still have the same goals. The difference is, First place does everything that they need to. And second place, who knows, maybe they just aren't as skilled, but maybe they're not doing everything that they need to do. Um, and the last thing that I'm gonna say is what of what to expect is you need to expect that you will have to give up, you'll have to sacrifice things. And this is part of being an elite athlete as well. This is like elite athletes have to sacrifice their health. They have to sacrifice family time. They have to sacrifice social things. They probably have to make some big decisions with their career that they wouldn't be, choosing those options if they weren't elite athletes. Um, but with the Ellis Danlos and the joint hypermobility, you have to sacrifice different things. You have to sacrifice things that don't make sense to other people sometimes. So going back to that comp prep example, I had to sacrifice doing cardio sometimes because I knew that if I did the cardio, my hip would be screwed. If my hip's screwed, I can't walk for a week. So I knew that if I took a rest day, even though I wasn't supposed to, I knew that taking a rest day would allow me to still continue training later in the week. Whereas if I hadn't and pushed through, I would have been a lot worse off. So it's sometimes things that don't make sense. You know, it's like stopping training when you really want to and you're feeling good, but the joints just don't feel good. It's um, giving up a sport that you love. You know, if you want to play rugby, but you also want to do powerlifting, I'm sorry, you will have to give up one and it's probably should be rugby because <laughs> I take it from my experience. It's not good for the joints. Um, but it's, it's gonna be doing that. And I get a lot of people messaging me with Ellis Danlos, you know, saying, oh, like I, I had to give up my sport. It's heartbreaking. You're so lucky that you're, you know, you're so healthy, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, oh, what's your sport? Kickboxing. Okay, well, I'm sorry, but I wanted to do that when I was a kid. And as, from a very young age, I decided I couldn't do it because it's not good for my body. So you telling me that I'm lucky for being able to do what I do? No, I just chose the one thing that I can do. Um, and lucky for you being getting into powerlifting and strength sports, it's something you want to do. And it's it's probably, in my opinion, the most viable sporting option for anyone with Ellis Danlos, apart from maybe like chess or something. But even then sitting for long periods isn't good for you. So I would personally choose powerlifting over chess. So those are my points of what to expect. Expect big things from yourself, expect big results. Um, you will have to take a different path from other people. You will have to work harder than other people but you can get there. You can get first place. You just might, it take, it might take a lot longer um, and you might have to work a lot harder and sacrifice a lot more. Second thing is to gain a lot of body awareness and really good positive body awareness that's gonna feel amazing and empowering and really, really good. Um, the third thing is lots of frustration and it doesn't get easier. The fourth thing is to have to explain yourself to a lot of people, but also know when to stop explaining yourself. Um, and then the last two are, you're gonna to have to work harder than everyone else and you're also gonna to have to give up things that sometimes don't make sense. Um, and that last one takes time and experience and practice and you will make mistakes along the way and you will not give up things that you should and you will give up things that you shouldn't, um, but it's all about learning and always doing your best um, and always having the best intentions. So my tips, <laughs> part two. Is this too long? I hope it's not too long. Anyway, back on track, tips. First tip is go for the 1% things. This is what I was talking about at the start. Diet, sleep, and not just sleep. Like I'm not saying just get, you know, get your sleep, but create a sleep hygiene routine. If you need to maximize your recovery, that could be the difference between you being able to push 1% harder in your next session and 1% harder over two years makes a big difference. Um, so create a sleep hygiene routine, um, figure out what's getting in the way, um, psychology, uh, using, Imagery, when I couldn't train, if my joints were too sore, if I had an injury and I couldn't train, I would sit and do imagery sessions, like where I would just like, this is my training session and I'm just imagining it. And there's like a lot of science behind imagery and I can do a video on that if you like as well, because it's really interesting. But 
that kind of thing. Nutrition, eating around your training, um, eating in your training if you need to, getting a really good coach that understands um, and doesn't just do you know aggressive progressions because I can't handle aggressive progressions and aggressive weight jumps. I need gentle, I need to coax my body along. Um, I can't push it to do anything it doesn't want to do. It will uh, create a revolution within my body and I don't want revolutions in my body. Uh, warm ups. My lifting experience changed when I decided to stop doing stretching as my warm ups and start doing muscle activation exercises. Your warm ups set the tone for your session. Warming up, not just so that I, I do the floor based warm ups, and then when I go to the actual exercise, I do a separate warm up for that as well. Both are really important. My floor based warm ups are all my muscle activation, my prehab, rehab exercises, and I work with someone to create specialty ones for my needs. Um, and the the warm-ups with the exercise, take it slow. Slow warm-ups. Um, earn the right to add weight to the bar. That's a saying I'm borrowing from um, Sebastian Arab at Base Gym. He, his approach to warm-ups is to always make sure every set is perfect and only then you can increase the weight. Um, and that is 100% what I would recommend. Take your warm-up slowly. It won't fatigue you. It'll make your session better. Find the right coach. We've kind of already been over that. Um, and be creative with your programming. Also ties into that. Don't, you don't just have to do aggressive progressions, things that might not work for other people or might seem dangerous for other people. Um, a lot of people are scared, like so scared of the Shaco routines. That was the best thing for my bench. It's sub-maximal training, high volume, um, pr practicing technique. That is what my, made my bench. My best bench was 115 um, and I, 115 kilos, and I got that through Shaco. And without it, I would not have been able to do it. Um, anywhere near that much weight. Um, and it was also really great for injuries for me, for bench. Not, I didn't do Shaco squats or deadlifts, and I can't recommend those because I haven't done them, but Shaco bench, it was great for me with my injuries, my shoulders, because it was all submaximal and it was just practice, practice, practice. Technique and practice, you're gonna have to get so much more practice with your technique with the Ellis deadlifts. Um, and there is very little margin for error with technique. Um, Oh, you got to fall in love with the process. You have to fall in love with it because there are some days it's like, it's like being in a relationship. There are some days when you're going to hate it and you just need to have something to fall back on. So you need to fall in love with the process and don't do this if it's not something you love. Don't force yourself to do something. You will burn out. Find a way to love it. Um, for me, it was creating a really good community of people around me so that I loved my training. Um, and I've just been doing it for so long that it's not even motivation anymore for me to train. It's just what I do. Um, Avoid training to failure and training to technical breakdown. Again, you've got such little margin for error with technique and things can go so wrong, so just don't do that. Prioritize technique. So take the time to learn the technique. Use a program that prioritizes technique. And um, like I know for me, with like with the Shaco bench example, I didn't touch anything. I remember I, a lot of my benching was 80, 85, 90 kilos, right? And then in competition, I benched 115. I didn't go over 100 in training, maybe once for a single um, in the lead up. And that was because I was laying the technique groundwork. Um, get a really good coach who understands technique. Film your sessions, film your workouts, film your training sets, film your warm up sets so you can see how they were moving. Um, that, that gives you the real time feedback. You can instantly check to see how you were. Um, and it's technique for you, not just technique. You know, someone else's technique for their body might not be the right technique for your body. So it's doing the right thing for you. Um, don't shy away from heavy weights and low reps. I like when I say heavy, I mean obviously moderately heavy so that you can um, still prioritize good movement and not at all compromise good movement. Um, and small jumps in your training sessions. So don't go, don't do big jumps in your warm ups and your working sets. Do small jumps to coax your body along. But with the low reps, a lot of people think with injury prone people or people who are new to training that they're better with higher reps. But the issue with higher reps is that once you get to the end of the set, you're probably fatigued, your technique is dropping. Um, we are talking about the skill of lifting here. You need to practice, practice, practice technique. And I know with the Ellis Dan loss, a lot of us are clumsy. I am. Uh, my body just does weird movements sometimes. So practicing the technique and really drilling it in can take a long time. There is a difference, I think, as well in the rate of force development in the muscles. So rate of force development ref uh, refers to how... Um, how your body produces force, how you go from zero to 100 basically in your muscles. So there is a difference and a difference in the patterning and difference in the rate of force development with people with Ellis Danlos. So different muscles fire at different rates than with normal people. I think, I think I say, like, don't quote me on that. I've seen studies on it, but I haven't read like 
in depth on this topic but I've noticed with myself that that is a thing and I need to really again coax my body along I can't expect it to go 100% um, from 0 to 100% um, but with the lower reps and more sets more volume it's a really good way to get that practice in so moderate weight um, a slightly higher volume and lower reps per set I would recommend um, oh, you need a good lifting physio. I've got a really good one. Andrew Locke is my man. He has been my physio for, uh, I think I messaged him a very panicked message in 2014. <laughs> I was like, Andrew, I'm going to quit lifting. I don't know who you are or what you do, but I've been recommended you by, um, by a friend. And I've been told that I need to come and see you. And, uh, since then, like I was going to quit, I was going to quit lifting if it wasn't for Andrew and Andrew has saved me so many times. And now I work with um, one of his colleagues, Shant as well, who helps me with my hip pain and uh, my sacroiliac joint issues. And which is really common with Ellis Danlos and joint hypermobility, by the way. And um, it, it, like I couldn't, I couldn't do what I do without them. So they're part of your team. They're part of your coaching team and your coach needs to be able to work with them. So that's another reason why I really, really, really liked Base Gym and Sebastian. Um, and that is because he works with Andrew. He works really closely with Andrew and he understands those methods and he incorporates them into his coaching. So a really good team of people around you. Um, so you've got your medical team, um, but with, within the training context, you need a good physio and they need to understand lifting. If your physio, if you've got Ellis Danlos and joint hypermobility and your physio is prescribing stretches as your main means of rehabilitation, get another physio. If your physio doesn't know what the training is that you're doing, get another physio. Um, it's 2021, you can get physios who consult online, we're in a lockdown, like everyone has moved to online. If you don't have a physio in your area, get one online. Um, it's, it's a non-negotiable. And my last point is for tips is to medicate injuries and pain with strength. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm an exercise scientist by, um, uh, I don't know, I'm educated as an exercise scientist, I've got an exercise science degree, that is what I do. I medicate um, a lot of my clients' pain with strength training. Um, obviously there are some pains, if you can't medicate it with strength training, you need to go see someone. But again, if you're working closely with your physio, hopefully it means that you don't really get to the point too many times where you um, need to see them a lot of the stuff that you should be doing is preventative what I've found with my physiotherapy stuff as well is that I will have a muscle imbalance that causes pain I'll fix that muscle imbalance by strengthening what's weak but then because my body is so screwed up with the Ellis Danlos just fixing that issue then causes another uh, muscle imbalance so for example my hips were really sore so I did some abductor work so some glute medius um, TFL abductor and then what actually happened was the hip pain came back, but this time it was like when I did my adductor, so like bringing in the opposite, um, that got rid of the pain. So all of a sudden I was like, okay, well, we've created a different imbalance. So it's, it's a lot of good physios will say, I want to treat you and not see you again. But with the Ellis Danlos, it's like, it's going to be a constant thing that you're just going to have to keep doing and doing and doing. And that's just what is, uh, what life is like with Ellis Danlos. It's a constant thing. But um, if you can, like for me, I've found a way to ingrain that in my career. So my career is strength training. My career is exercise and learning about the human body. And for me, that's been really, it's given me insight that not many people have. So um, I guess the last tip that I would add, even though I already said that this other one was the last, is to um, always find ways to seek the positive you know getting an injury teaches you what was weak once you strengthen what's weak you're going to be even stronger um, the perspective that you get from Ellis Danlos is incredible it will open up the doors for you to communicate with other people with disabilities that normally you wouldn't be able to communicate with um, if you have like a normie body <laughs> and um, that is an incredible blessing because there are some really incredible people out there who you will be able to connect with on a different level um, it is, it is a great way to teach you how to be creative. You will learn, you will take, do measures that other people don't um, ever think to do or know how to do. Um, and yeah, you will become, through strength training, I think you will really thrive and um, do things that you never thought were possible. And I am so excited for you to be doing this. And please, 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 uh, update me on how you go and anyone who's watching this who is in the same boat and has Ellis Danlos joint hypermobility and wants to get into competitive strength training 
please drop me a message, leave a comment. If you already do strength training competitively or non-competitively, please leave a comment below. Let me know what your favorite thing is about strength training, what it's done for you with your Ellis Danlos, and maybe even one tip that you would have for people who have Ellis Danlos or joint hypermobility who are starting out um, or looking to get competitive. And I, am, I really enjoyed doing this and I'm hoping to do some more. So um, thanks for making it this far. <laughs> Uh, enjoy, enjoy your day and if you're in Sydney or anywhere else in the world that's locked down, happy lockdown and yeah.